On this Wednesday night, how Democrats in the U.S. defied expectations. Definitely not a Republican wave, that's for darn sure. What motivated voters in the midterms? Plus, the biggest losers and winners. Florida is where woke goes to die. What it all means for 2024. And I talked to Canada's ambassador in Washington about the health of American democracy. Meta layoffs, what massive job cuts could mean for a global tech giant and the industry. Plus, where did it come from? Why was it so important? The mystery surrounding a wartime relic featured at this year's Remembrance Day. Global National with Donna Frazen, reporting tonight from Washington. Good evening and thanks for joining us. The American midterm elections, which were expected to give a boost to Republican fortunes, have defied historical odds and exceeded the expectations of opinion polls and of pundits. Some of the votes are still being counted, but Democrats could keep control of the Senate, though are looking likely to lose their majority in the House of Representatives. Historically, the party that holds the White House does badly in the midterms. That didn't happen this time. And today, President Joe Biden is sounding buoyant. I am so optimistic about the prospects for America. We need to be looking to the future. The fact that the Democratic Party outperformed anything anyone expected and did better than any uh, off-year presidency since John Kennedy is one that gives everybody like, whoo, sigh of relief that the mega Republicans are not taking over Jackson Prosco, our Washington bureau chief, is with me. Uh, Jackson, he certainly sounded relieved and, and, and buoyant, as I said, with these results. What do you think the results mean for Biden himself and for the country? You know, it seems that overwhelmingly Americans decided they were in favor of the party of Biden and not the party of Trump. And I think in doing so, they're sending a strong message about the type of values they're willing to accept for the country. And perhaps they bought some breathing room for American democracy. It was a night of big wins for Democrats. And tonight, that's why I'll be the next U.S. Senator from Pennsylvania. And clear upsets for Republicans, as star candidates like Dr. Mehmet Oz were soundly defeated. Others, like Herschel Walker, now languish in races too close to call. If you can hang in, hang in there a little bit longer. The unpopularity of President Joe Biden, a faltering economy and record high inflation did not sway voters. Definitely not a Republican wave, that's for darn sure. But the man not on the ballot, former President Donald Trump, played a huge role. We have uh, some races that are hot and heavy and we're all watching them here. Trump's hand-picked candidates were more often than not defeated. Most had backed his election fraud lies. If I was a Republican, I would absolutely uh, distance myself from Trump. The Trump candidates, top to bottom, have done far, far, far more poorly than the, the more independent ones. Yeah, that's right. That strategy worked for Florida Governor Ron DeSantis, who won re-election in a landslide. We not only won election, we have rewritten the political map. While New York, once a stronghold for Democrats, became a surprising battleground. Elsewhere, the party's one-time stars like Beto O'Rourke in Texas and Stacey Abrams in Georgia failed to break through. Yet Democrats remain buoyed by broad successes across the board. Michigan's Democratic governor, Gretchen Whitmer, cruised to re-election. Her party swept the state house and voters backed a referendum protecting abortion rights. We are feeling damn good about where we are headed. A remarkable night for a party that wasn't expecting much to celebrate. Not just voters in Michigan upholding abortion access rights, they did it in Kansas too. This is a sign that this was, at the end of the day, a major motivating factor for voters, especially young ones who turned out in droves. At the end of the day, Donna, very hard for a lot of women, especially to separate the loss of rights 
and the economic argument, in many ways, they're intertwined. Definitely. And, and Jackson, in the final days of the campaign, we kept hearing President Biden hammer home the message that democracy was on the line in this vote. There were a lot of people, including some Democrats, who said that was the wrong tack to take, the wrong message. Do we have any way to measure if it had an impact? You know, at the end of the day, actually, it does seem likely that it did have an impact. And I think the reason we can say that is because it brought out those young voters who are deeply concerned about the future, but also the vast majority of those election-denying Republican candidates candidates who are on the ballot for positions that actually have oversight of elections, they've lost. They are not winning their elections by running on an anti-democratic brand. All right, Jackson Prosco, thank you. Well, one man who has emerged as a threat to former President Donald Trump's apparent intention to run for office again is Florida Governor Ron DeSantis. He won easily last night. Some Republican strategists are already calling him the front runner. And President Biden said tonight he looks forward to watching Trump and DeSantis take each other on. Eric Sorensen looks at what's shaping up for the 2024 presidential campaign. We will never, ever surrender to the woke mob. Almost overnight, Republican Governor Ron DeSantis has become a national political force and Donald Trump's new nightmare. And I have only begun to fight. Trump has already given DeSantis a nickname. There it is, Trump at 71, Ron DeSanctimonious at... 10%. A telltale sign that Trump sees a threat for the Republican presidential nomination. Trump quoted online that DeSantis could hurt himself badly. I would tell you things about him that won't be very flattering. He's not going to spend the next few months talking about Joe Biden nearly as much as he'll talk about DeSantis because that's the most immediate threat to him. DeSantis has already created a national presence, sparking protests with a bill that prohibits classroom instruction to young children on sexual orientation and gender identity. He infuriated many when he had migrants flown to Massachusetts, a Democratic-run state. And that's what Biden's doing. He created the border crisis. He has targeted the U.S. president and is popular enough to campaign for other Republicans outside Florida. Are you ready to save New York State? Trump, meantime, looks vulnerable after hedging his bets in the midterms last night on News Nation. I think if they win, I should get all the credit. And if they lose, I should not be blamed at all. But key candidates that Trump supported lost. And some Republicans do blame him. A lot of Republicans lost who shouldn't have been running to begin with. And I think this hurts Trump fundamentally. I, I would be very surprised if Trump were the Republican nominee in 2024. This ain't your father's Republican Party. President Joe Biden may be itching to run against any Republican, but he's almost 80, and many in his own party quietly expect or hope he won't run again. If he isn't going to run for president, again, in about you know, six months, that has to be known. Um, he, has to, he has to let other people know to line up for, for other candidates. Democrats may offer Biden the courtesy of waiting for him to decide. For Trump and the Republicans... And I'm going to try to bring the Trump organization to Palm Beach. Past alliances could quickly turn nasty if DeSantis throws his hat in the ring. Eric Sorensen, Global News. To Canadian News, Alberta Premier Danielle Smith now has a seat in the legislature after winning a by-election. Make no mistake, from what you saw from the results today, we certainly have a fight ahead of us. Turnout was low. Smith won just under 55% of the votes cast. She's admitted that was not the decisive mandate she was looking for. Albertans are set to go to the polls in a general election on May 29th. To the Emergencies Act inquiry in Ottawa now, the mayor of Coots, Alberta, says his community is still divided since a protest blockade formed in his border town in February. Testifying today, Jim Willett said he spoke out against border vaccine mandates as mayor, but once the blockade began, it lost his support. You stand there with your foot on my throat and say, you're not going to go through here anymore. And what you're doing is you're actually choking the, uh, the livelihood of, of all your, your friends and neighbors. Ontario's Deputy Solicitor General also took the stand today. His testimony was cut short, though, when the lawyer questioning him collapsed. That lawyer was taken to the hospital and is expected to be okay. There is a fresh focus on Canada's relationship with China from both sides of the political spectrum following Global's exclusive reporting earlier this week about alleged Chinese interference in the 2019 federal election campaign. Today, during his first media availability in nearly two months, Conservative leader Pierre Polyev called for a parliamentary committee investigation. 
I think it's very troubling that the Prime Minister has known about allegations of foreign interference in Canadian elections since last January and he hasn't taken any action. I haven't seen any evidence of action from this government to protect our democracy from that kind of foreign interference. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau is heading to Asia for a series of summits next week. Our new Ottawa reporter, Mackenzie Gray, explains what the government is signaling about its approach to China. A new approach from the federal government on relations with a growing superpower. The China of 1970 is not the China of today. China is an increasingly disruptive global power. The stern warning from Foreign Affairs Minister Melanie Jolie signals a new path for the Liberals' Indo-Pacific strategy. In a wide-ranging speech, Jolie vowed Canada would confront China on their treatment of the Uyghur population, defend territorial rights of Hong Kong and Taiwan, and caution Canadian businesses operating in China. The decision you take as business people are your own. As Canada's top diplomat, my job is to tell you that there are geopolitical risks linked to doing business with the country. To lessen those geopolitical risks, the Liberals want businesses to diversify their trade and deepen relations with India and other friendly nations in Asia. The Indo-Pacific market is all about relationships and business is about relationships. We need to be present. We need to be there. The more confrontational approach makes a major reversal for Jolie, who didn't even mention China in the government's first draft of their Indo-Pacific strategy. The message to China should be simple. We have no problem with you being a superpower. You have to stop acting as a bully and you have to respect international law. But it's Canadian election law that China is alleged to have broken. Sources tell Global News Chinese agents allegedly infiltrated the offices of sitting members of parliament and spent nearly a quarter million dollars funding a secret network of at least 11 candidates who ran both for the Liberals and Conservatives in the 2019 general election. For Justin Trudeau's former foreign affairs advisor, the alleged interference underscores the need for the government to act on China. It's a very encouraging outline, but in my line of business at least, you don't get grades for an outline, you get it for the essay. The Liberals would get to test out their new China strategy in the coming days as the Prime Minister is set to travel tomorrow to multiple international summits in Asia, including the G20. Donna? Mackenzie Ray in Ottawa. Thanks. Major layoffs at a global tech giant. Coming up, what job cuts at Meta signal for the tech sector? A round of mass layoffs is never good news for any company. And today, Meta, the parent company of Facebook, Instagram, and WhatsApp, announced it is cutting its workforce by 13%. That adds up to 11,000 employees. As Anne Gaviola explains, it's just the latest wave of economic woes that have been slamming the tech industry recently. The social media giant has never axed jobs on this scale before. Meta CEO and Facebook founder Mark Zuckerberg offered a mea culpa. The macroeconomic downturn, increased competition and ad signal loss caused our revenue to be much lower than expected, he said in a statement. I got this wrong. Meta sank billions into the so-called metaverse, but lost sight of its other platforms, including Instagram and Facebook. The cuts will be across the board, with a big blow to the recruiting team as the company reduces headcount and real estate footprint to slash costs. Global News reached out, but the company wouldn't say how many Canadian jobs have been cut. Layoffs and about face from March, when the company was set to hire 2,500 people in Canada. It's an illustration of just how quickly things can change in technology, that you think that you're going into a fast growth period, you're, you're all optimistic, you're making all sorts of rosy announcements, and then just a few months later, the economic winds tend to change direction. Terminations and hiring freezes have been the trend among the biggest names in tech in recent months, including Ottawa-based e-commerce giant Shopify, chipmaker Intel, and Twitter under Elon Musk's ownership and tech is seen as a bellwether for the broader economy. And as a result, as technology starts to retrench and as big tech companies start to resize themselves for this new reality, other sectors should be watching and paying attention. The tech surge, reflected in soaring stock prices and hiring binges, is over. Now there's a potential recession set to follow the current pullback in spending on ads and technology. Anne Gaviola, Global News, Toronto. 
Now to the war in Ukraine. Russia's defense minister has ordered troops to retreat from Kherson, the only Ukrainian regional capital captured by Russia. The defense minister says it's no longer possible to supply the city or Russian troops, so they're being pulled back to the east bank of the Dnipro River. Over the past few weeks, the Russians have also relocated more than 100,000 people from the city. The retreat appears to be a serious setback, but Ukraine fears it could be part of a wider strategy or a trap. Ahead, I speak with Canada's ambassador to the U.S. and get her perspective on the health of our closest neighbor's democracy. People have said to me, why do you have to cover the U.S. midterm elections? Well, here's why. The U.S. is not only Canada's closest neighbor, we share the world's longest international border. We have 120 land ports of entry. Nearly $2.6 billion in goods and services are traded between the U.S. and us every day. That, plus all the cultural and the family ties, is why we pay such close attention to this place. Earlier today, I spoke with someone whose job is to manage the relationship. Canada's ambassador to the United States. Thank you so much for joining us today. It's a delight to be here, thank you. You know Canadians watch the United States closely, certainly whenever there's an election. And in this election cycle, particularly because of the polarization and the political violence, what's your takeaway from these midterms? Well, you know, I actually would like to say that I think that yesterday was a really good day for a U.S. democratic process. It was very high voter turnout, uh, both in advance and on election day. Uh, there, it was a safe and orderly election. It's not to say that there weren't a few incidents here and there. There were, but by and large, uh, it was it was a very safe and orderly election with a big voter turnout. There's still more votes to be counted, but I do think, especially given, as you say, that there was concern around safety and around security, the fact that it was so normal and so well attended is a real vote of confidence uh, for the U.S. system. President Biden and former President Obama were both campaigning in the final days, saying that democracy was on the ballot in these midterms. Are you confident that the guardrails in place are strong enough in this country to protect democracy? I am, but I do believe that Americans need to keep paying attention to those guardrails. They need to be paying attention to their democracy and fighting for it. And I think they are fighting for it. I think the reason that we are hearing so much about it is because they care so much about it. Um, you know, it's, it's true that the rhetoric around uh, political discourse sometimes, the tone and tenor is, is divisive, is, is, is disrespectful. But that's not just true in the United States. That's true in, in a lot of countries. It's true in our country from time to time. Um, and I think we need to pay attention to that. Since you mentioned President Obama, one of, one of the things that he used to say is that it's important to learn how to disagree without being disagreeable. That's probably something we should all think about. Let me ask you about the Trusted Traveler program, the Nexus program. It's still not fixed, right? I think there's a backlog about half a million Canadians who are waiting to for have their... for Nexus. It's about 350,000. Oh, okay, still a lot. It's still a, a lot. lot. Not to diminish it. And they've been lot. waiting a while. Yeah. And I understand that there's still the the issue is not resolved. The Canadian Chamber of Commerce, I think, is worried that the program might be ended. Is that the outcome here? No, it's not the outcome. And actually. Just at the end of last week and the beginning of this week, Minister Mendicino spoke twice with Secretary Mayorkas. I have been speaking with the most senior officials in the Department of Homeland Security about the program. And I think there's really two things to say. Most important, the U.S. has recommitted time and time again to the program and said we want it to su they want it to succeed, they want it to continue. I'm not worried. It takes time. It is. It's frustrating for those that are waiting, including people, you know, in, in, at the embassy and in my family and I'm sure all of our families, but we'll get there. All right. Ambassador, thank you. My pleasure. Thank you. A relic of Canada's past. Next, why a mysterious flag found at Dieppe will be displayed in Ottawa. During the national ceremony in Ottawa this Remembrance Day, a flag that's at the center of a multi-decade mystery will be on display. It's believed it was carried during the Dieppe Raid in northern France, what became Canada's deadliest day of the Second World War. And as Mike Armstrong reports, the riddle of the flag's origins makes it all the more fascinating. 
It is one flag with two stories. One fascinating, the other a mystery. We'll start with what is known and who it belonged to last. I wish Dad would be here. I think he'd be. I think he'd be overwhelmed. Mike Lowry of Lexington, Virginia, donated the flag to the Royal Canadian Legion. He says his father Charles got it from a friend in 1965, an American veteran from the Second World War who had guarded German prisoners. Well, that veteran apparently found the flag on a POW, a German who said he'd been in Dieppe for Canada's failed raid in 1942. He'd been burying bodies and took it off a Canadian who'd been killed. The American soldier took it. The friend told Dad that they planned to give it to a Canadian unit when they ran across one, but unfortunately they never ran across one. So that's the story that's known, but there's a twist. It is a Canadian flag, but it wasn't Canada's flag at the time of the Dieppe raid. It's much older. The shield at the bottom right includes a charging buffalo representing Manitoba, but nothing for BC. Well, those provinces joined Canada barely a year apart. That means this was Canada's flag in 1870 and 1871. It predates the Dieppe raid by more than seven decades. I was shocked that a flag that's so old would be in such good shape. I'd say it's priceless. Now that brings us to the unknown. Why would a 70 year old flag be at Dieppe? It, it, it's a fantastic mystery. Military historian David O'Keefe says it could have been a soldier's family heirloom, something passed on possibly from a father to a son for good luck. But there are more questions, he says, than answers. Where did it come from? Why was it so important? Why was it considered, if it was a good luck charm, why was it considered that way? During this year's National Remembrance Day service, the flag will be displayed in front of the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier, a symbol of the sacrifice at Dieppe for this 80th anniversary. He probably wouldn't believe it. Mike Lowry says for decades, his late father always wanted to give the flag to a Canadian family or a regiment. Instead, he says it feels like he gave it to the entire country. Mike Armstrong, Global News, Ottawa. We will have live coverage of this year's Remembrance Day ceremony in Ottawa at 10.30 a.m. Eastern, 7.30 Pacific, right here on Global and on our website, globalnews.ca. That is Global National for this Wednesday from the American capital. I'm Donna Friesen. Thanks for watching. For now, good night from Washington.